Good morning. I want to welcome you to the 20th uh, Simple Truths Conference. And uh, we're going to have an exciting day. <clears throat> we have um, Brian Osborne and from Answers uh, in Genesis. And there's so many questions, so many um, uh, theories, per se, speculation about the creation of, of man. And yet, God has given to us very clear answers. And there should be no reason, at least <clears throat> in the Christian community, what took place and how it took place. And um, we can debate about the when, but it's really irrelevant. The fact that man is here, someone created him. And uh, it isn't an accident. It isn't something that um, just happened somewhere in the dark and that. And so we uh, thank God that we're able to present this conference that many of you, especially many of you young individuals that are going to school, you will hear these lies that the secular community will profess over and over again, knowing that it's wrong information, false information, fraudulent information. And yet, um, you will have to give an answer. First Peter 3.15 says that we are to give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that lies in us with meekness and fear. And so we should be able to articulate our faith reasonably and very sound to be able to give them what the Bible says about God, man, sin, creation. And so that they may not believe it, that's okay, but you can't explain it away, you can't dismiss it. You have to deal with it. And so we're going to get started. Why don't you guys welcome Brian Osborne. Good morning. Everybody doing all right? Thanks for coming out on Saturday. Wow. Praise God. So glad you're here. Uh, it's good to be in California. You might tell I'm not from this area originally. Does that clear my accent? I don't know. Maybe a little bit. Um, I'm from North Carolina originally. Grew up there. Lived in Tennessee for quite a while. Now I work with the ministry of Answers in Genesis. Anybody familiar with Answers in Genesis already? I feel, praise God. Some people are saved. All right. Very good. I'm just kidding. That's not... That's not <laughs> please don't say that the wrong way. Is a joke. No, but if you are familiar with the ministry, then we have uh, a couple of things going on over in the east side of the U.S. We have the Creation Museum. You may have heard about the Creation Museum, and we walk people through biblical history, answer questions, defend the faith. <clears throat> and one of the things I say up front about our ministry is that really and truly, you hear answers in Genesis, and some people tend to think, well, you guys are just on about winning a debate, right, about the age, the earth, or evolution. That's what you're on about. Actually, that's not our passion. Our passion is defending biblical authority, where it's being attacked today, so we as Christians, like Pastor said, can stand on God's word, defend our faith, in order to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes hearts and lives. That's our passion. That is our heartbeat. That's the purpose behind the Creation Museum. It's also the purpose behind the Ark Encounter. You may have heard that we built a life-size replica of Noah's Ark. I'll turn the music down a little bit. This is in northern Kentucky, right below Cincinnati, around 40 miles south of that area. It is a life-size replica, over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 50 feet tall with three different levels, over 100,000 square feet on the inside. And as you go through the inside, there are multiple exhibits, over 130 exhibit bays as you walk through. And what we're doing in each case is we're answering questions. How did Noah get the animals onto the ark? Where did the water front come from? Where did it go? How does Noah's flood explain the rock layers and the fossils, so forth and so on? And what we're doing is we're showing people. Believers and unbelievers are like that. God's word is true. It's right about everything. Past, present, and future. Why? Because it's God's word. He gets everything right. And so trust what it says about salvation. If you get a chance to go, it is a phenomenal place to visit. Anybody been to the Ark Encounter? Oh, praise God, a couple of you. I know it's a long ways from here. Uh, if you get a chance to make it that site, it is incredible. It's well worth the visit. Lots of other stuff to do in Cincinnati area as well if you get a chance to go. The Creation Museum, if you like baseball, Cincinnati Red, so forth and so on. But it is incredible. But here's the thing. People look at that. They look at that and they say, okay, that's awesome. But, uh, I mean, why are you guys so passionate about this? I mean, is it really that important? I mean, you build a $100 million arc. You got a creation museum. You got speakers. You got curriculum. You got videos. Is this really so important? Why are you guys so passionate about it? And here's the thing. We, that's kind of what this session is all about, by the way. The first session is the why. All right, we're going to jump into why this is important, why we're passionate, and then we'll go to some of the answers after this session. But we're so passionate about this because we've noticed that God's word is under attack. 
Have you guys noticed that? Not hard to see, right? We're seeing that God's was under attack, and we're seeing the effects of that attack both inside and outside the church, right? And basically, we've noticed along with that attack that our nation is headed in the wrong direction. Have you guys noticed that? It's not hard to see, right? It's actually it's not just America. It's the entire Western world. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview and the rise of secular humanism. But the fact that it's happening in America is really astounding because we think about it. America really is the most Christianized nation ever, isn't it? I mean, we have more churches than anybody else in the world. We have more Bible colleges, more seminaries, more Christian colleges. We have more Christian bookshops. Really, America, we have more Christian resources than any other nation has ever had in all of history. Isn't that a staggering thought? But for all those Christian resources, are we as a nation becoming more Christian or less every day? And what's the answer? less and rapidly so. George Barna a couple years ago pointed out that around 4,000 churches a year are closing their doors in America. The church in America is losing around 3 million people a year to some form of secularism. Newsweek back in 2009 made this declaration on their cover, the decline and fall of Christian America. And you open up to make a really good observation. They said this, The present, in this sense, it's less about the death of God, but more about the birth of many gods. Notice what they're saying. We used to be one nation under God, but now we're one nation under many gods. Isn't it great? See how tolerant we are? (laughs) That's funny, too. I know if you think about it. But (laughs) did you know at a foundational level, there are actually only two religions? You say two, just two, at a foundational level. You see, either God's word is true, and we build our thinking from here, or it's not, and in some way, shape, or form, man's word becomes the ultimate authority. Those are the two foundational religions. And what we've seen in our culture has been a shift away from God's word being the foundation for much of our cultural thinking to now man's word has become the ultimate authority. Man now decides his own truth. Each person decides their own truth. And that's why truth is relative in our culture today, because each person decides their own truth. And that's why we look a whole lot like Judges 21, 25. When there was no king in Israel, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And does that not sound like our culture today? And this is why America and many others, many other cultures, feel free to redefine morality, redefine marriage, to redefine sanctity of life, to redefine things even as basic as gender Nine-year-old boy posing as a girl for National Geographic back in January. This eight-year-old boy over in Canada competing in drag competitions, supported by his parents, and that's seen as good and right and to be celebrated according to our culture. And of course, this concerns me for numerous reasons, not the least of which is I have a son. His name is Ian. He is three, and he is very camera shy, as you can tell. (laughs) My beautiful wife, Marla, of 20 years this summer. Uh, And so uh, as I look at Ian, Ian right now... He's not concerned about the culture, right? His uh, big, biggest concern in life right now is the lack of sufficient playtime, right? That's, let's get enough playtime, Daddy. Let's, let's do some Legos. Let's throw some ball. Let's tackle, which is so much fun. It's such a fun time right now. And so, uh, yeah, he's not worried about the culture. But you know what? I am. How do I equip him, myself included, and my son to engage this secular culture that's becoming more secular every day? How do I equip him to defend the faith so he can stand boldly on the word of God and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world? I mean, who would ever thought we would live in a nation where we'd see around 4,000 babies a day murdered in their mother's womb? Almost 60 million since Roe v. Wade. Who would have thought we would live in a day and age where we were told, do not call pregnant women expectant mothers. That would offend the transgender movement. Call them pregnant people. And that's seen as good. We never thought we would live in a day and age where Disney would go gay, quote-unquote, the first exclusively gay moment in the last Beauty and the Beast remake. Of course, that really shouldn't surprise us too much because they had the first exclusively gay kiss <clears throat> on one of their cartoons not too long ago on their cable channel. I could go on. It gets depressing, right? I get that. Can we just all agree for the sake of time our culture has lost its ever-loving mind? We can agree on that, right? Pretty easy. Pretty easy to see. The question really is, why? And maybe a better way to word this question is, why isn't the, why isn't the church influencing the culture like it used to years ago? Here's what we suggest. 
because in many cases the culture has infiltrated and influenced the church. That in many cases the church has compromised with the secular thinking of our day. We've undermined biblical authority and thus we're seeing the consequences of that attack on God's word, both inside and outside the church. God's word is coming under attack. We have compromised. We're seeing the consequences of that attack, of that compromise. And guys, the fact that God's word is under attack is nothing new. It's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3. When the devil said to Eve, did God really say? First attack on the word of God. And notice what it is. It's very clever. It's very subtle. He's getting Eve to question God's word, to doubt God's word, to reject God's word. And the method was so effective, he's used it ever since. Different forms, but same basic attack. We're actually warned in 2 Corinthians that just as the serpent deceived Eve, he'll strive to deceive you in the same way, to get you to question, doubt, and reject God's word. And one of the main ways he's doing this today in our culture is through the teaching of things like evolution, eight men, Big Bang, millions of years, using those sorts of ideas to get people to question God's word, to doubt God's word, to reject God's word. And hear me, what it's really been, it's been like a stealth attack by the enemy who has attacked the history of the Bible to undermine the authority of the Bible, to undermine the gospel that's based in that authority. Because let's think about it, just honestly. If we cannot believe the Bible's history, why on earth would you trust what it says about salvation? Right? If you can't believe Genesis 1-1, why would you trust John 3-16? And for so many people in our culture today, this is their stomach block. And the secularists, the non-believers, they understand this is a great way to attack God's word and undermine God's word by attacking the history. Let me give you one example of this. I'll show you a clip of a guy named Lawrence Krauss, professor of physics over at Arizona State University, here teaching back in 2009 to an atheist conference. Listen to what he says, and listen to the reaction of the crowd. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded, because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution, weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created the nuclear furnaces of stars, and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? And, and anyway, he's great. I don't know which is worse, the statement or the reaction. Forget Jesus. The stars die for you. Why forget Jesus? Well, because you're not here because God created you, like the Bible says. You're here because stars exploded. And the stardust in your left hand is different from the stardust in your right hand. The Bible is wrong about history. Why trust it about morality or salvation? This same guy later on said this at a different conference, that change is always one generation away. So if we can plant the seeds of doubt in our children, sounds like Genesis 3, religion will go away in a generation, or at least largely go away. And I believe that's what we have an obligation to do. He is zealous for his religion of atheism. He's very passionate about it. And by the way, he's right. Change is always one generation away. We see it in the Bible numerous times. We see it happening right before our very eyes. I don't know if you realize this, but around two-thirds of kids today, according to multiple studies, who grew up in the church are walking away from the faith by the time they reach college age, many of whom are not returning. And guys, these are the kids who grow up in church. They're part of Awanas and VBS and youth group. Two-thirds of those kids are walking away. And so, of course, this concerns us, as I'm sure it does you. So we want to try to figure out why. And we did a research project with Brent Beamer from America's Research Group to try to figure this out. And he interviewed a 1,000 of these kids, these millennials, these 20s and 30-somethings, to try to figure out what was going on. And let me show you just two of his major findings I think will surprise you like it did for us. When he asked them, those who had walked away. If you don't believe, when did you first have doubts? And I want you to notice, it was not college. And isn't that what we tend to think as Christian parents? We raise our kids right, they're doing all fine. Then we send them off to the secular college, and the atheist professor, Lawrence Krauss, like you just saw, guys like him, he convinces them the Bible's not true, and they walk away. No, no, and no. The research shows that these kids had all these questions really starting in middle school and high school. 
What sort of questions? The same questions I heard for 13 years teaching Bible history in a public school in Tennessee. Do you guys have that here in California? It's just in a couple of schools in Tennessee. It's rare, all right, even over there. Uh, same questions I heard there working for, with youth for 20 years in the church. Questions like, well, uh, Mr. Osborne, if the Bible's true, then where did God come from? And what about the eight men? And who did Cain marry? And if the Bible's true, how do you explain those dinosaurs? And what about the rock layers and fossils? And what about the radioisotopes? Don't they prove millions of years? And doesn't that disprove the Bible? Hey, if we all come from Adam and Eve, then how do you explain all these different races all around the world? And then why is there so much death and suffering in this world? Hey, hasn't science disproved the Bible? You heard some of those? We all have, right? Because that's where the attack is happening today. It's interesting. A few months ago, I was doing a conference over in Michigan area, and it was a youth conference, church youth. Over a thousand kids at the conference. And it was a fantastic conference, and there were many speakers, multiple days. And there were many fantastic speakers, godly men and women, uh, entertaining, funny, engaging, biblical. It was just a blessing to be part of what they were doing. And during the days, we had breakout sessions. Right? And the kids could choose which breakout they wanted to go to during the day. And it was literally only my breakout that looked like this every single day for every single session. And I don't know if you can see that, but kids are sitting on the floor in front of me. Like they were like literally right at my feet. I felt like a rabbi or something. I didn't know what was going on. All right. You know, they're standing up on the walls. They're all around us. They're literally everywhere. And they came not because of me. They came because of the subjects. What was I talking about? Evolution dinosaurs, the rock layers and the fossils, one blood, one race. Those were their questions. You see, those are the questions they had that for the most part are not getting answered at church or at home from a biblical perspective. And you see, for them, for multiple generations, again, these are, we're talking teens, 20s, 30s, 40-somethings even, they've grown up in a generation, a culture, they've been told you can't trust the Bible in this scientific age. It's been bombed out by these sorts of ideas. And so they're left wondering, okay, well, how do, how do I answer that from a biblical perspective? Hey, Christian mom, dad, how do I answer this? What about the cavemen? And what about dinosaurs? Hey, Christian grandma, uh, who did Cain marry? And, and how do you know the Bible's true? And, and all those sorts of questions. Hey, Christian leader, Christian pastor, how do I understand the Bible in light of millions of years? And what about distant starlight and all these other issues? Hasn't science history of the Bible? How do I understand this? Give me answers. And for the most part, you know our response has been, for about the, probably the last 50 to 100 years, maybe more, when we've heard those sort of questions, in general, we have said this, and I've said this exact statement before God got a hold of me on this issue. We've told them something like this. Honey, I don't know about the rock layers or the fossils or dinosaurs or the eight men, but hey, don't worry about that. Just trust in Jesus anyway. Sound familiar? And do we want them to trust in Jesus? Yes! That is of eternal importance. The most important decision they'll ever make, yes. But when we say, don't worry about it, just trust in Jesus anyway, we're ignoring their foundational question. Their question is, why should I trust in your Jesus? That message of Jesus comes from this book, Mom and Dad. And here's my point. When I'm, here's why I'm asking, Mom and Dad. If this book is wrong over here, why should I trust what it says over here? If you can't trust the beginning, why should I trust the middle or the end? That's my question. And we're ignoring that question. And what we found is this, according to the research, most of these kids who walked away were walking away in their hearts and in their minds before they ever left physically for college. They're sitting in our pews, in our homes right now, <clears throat> and they're already gone. And that's why we entitled the book Already Gone. And when we asked them the reasons for leaving, one of the main reasons was hypocrisy. And we said, well, define that for us. What do you mean by hypocrisy? And this is what the majority said. They said, well... We grew up in church, and we were told in church that this book is the Word of God. Trust everything that it says, especially the part about Jesus, put your faith and trust in Him. But then they said we were told later on, in some way, shape, or form, by a Christian parent or grandparent or Christian leader or someone they respect, that we as Christians, we don't necessarily believe this part of the book. And you can take evolution and eight men and Big Bang and millions of years. You can take man's ideas, reinterpret this first part. That part's not important. Just be sure you believe the rest of it. And you trust in Jesus. And guys, they see it as hypocrisy and rightfully so. And we're seeing a lot of testimonies like this young man's. ...of how I became an atheist. I was born into a Christian family and indoctrinated as, uh, growing up as a kid. That next year was freshman year of high school, and I started learning about evolution in my biology class. 
then uh, that's where I realized I had never seriously questioned or thought about my religious beliefs. So as I learned about evolution and just started thinking philosophically about it, I realized that there couldn't be a God. So I became an atheist. I bet most of us know someone with a similar quote-unquote testimony because two-thirds are walking away from the faith, and this is one of the main reasons. And guys, hear me. I'm sure that Christians like myself had the best of intentions when we said, I don't know about that trust in Jesus anyway. We had the best of intentions, but can't we even as Christians have the best of intentions and still get the worst of consequences? Isn't that possible? Hey, I know it's a heavy talk, especially on a Saturday morning, all right? So let me give you some light-hearted examples of when Christians had good intentions but got bad consequences. Light-hearted examples. Let me show you some bad church bulletin titles. I illustrate this really, really well. Maybe you can relate to some of these. I don't know. Like this one. The Peace Banking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to conflict. <laughs> Just could have been worded a little bit better, right? Or this one. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. Which, if you do counseling, that's good. All right, just roll with that. Um, uh, this next one at the service tonight. The sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early, listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing too hard. All right. <laughs> and then this last one. Barbara remains in the hospital. She's having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> Good intentions, bad consequences, right? And guys, with the best of intentions, we, we've ignored many of their questions. We told them to trust in Jesus anyway. With the best of intentions, instead of teaching them apologetics, what we have taught them for the most part in our churches is, well, Bible stories. And don't get me wrong, I do love a good story, but what's the word story tend to mean in our modern language today? Fiction, right? Fairy tale, not true. So in a real sense, we're telling our kids come to church and go to Sunday school or whatever and learn about all these great Bible stories. Noah and the Ark, Little Red Riding Hood, Adam and Eve, the tortoise and the hare. It'll be great. Good moral truths, but not real history. Not real things. And then we show them pictures like this of Noah's Ark as an overloaded bathtub, right? Every time. Giraffes are somehow coming out of some sort of chimney every single time. And what I don't get, all these pictures, everybody's happy even though the whole world is being destroyed. <laughs> Makes no sense to me, Right? Now, <clears throat> I do understand the picture's meant to be cute for kids. I get the idea. But kids are very impressionable, aren't they? You show a kid a picture like this. Does that tell that kid, Noah's Ark and Flood, real event or fairy tale? Fairy tale. And that's what the world is already screaming at our kids. The Bible's a book of fairy tales. Why trust anything it says? And you see, for our kids, multiple generations, they have all these questions that they're looking for answers to. Legitimate questions. So how do we answer these from a biblical perspective? And they go to church looking for answers, and they're not getting any. They're not getting apologetics. The word apologetics does not mean to apologize. It means to give a defense, like a lawyer in a courtroom, to give an answer for your faith, to proclaim the gospel clearly. That's what apologetics is. But we're not doing that. We're giving them Bible stories and telling them to trust in Jesus. Don't worry about that stuff. So they go looking for answers to other places. Where do they go? They go to school, Right? And they go to their textbooks, and they go to mu museums, they go to zoos, they go to Wikipedia to learn about the real history of the universe. Real things like evolution and millions of years. When they get to church, stories. Is it any one or two-thirds are walking away from the faith? <clears throat> and here's the thing, that history in Genesis, guys, it's not fiction. It is real history, and it is really, really important. And we summarize biblical history at answers with the seven C's, we call them. And the first four... Those first four seeds, that's really the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That's the biblical history. That's the geological, biological, anthropological, astronomical history. That is the foundation to the next three seeds, which is Christ, cross, and consummation. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see these seven seeds are married, and they cannot be divorced. A couple examples. Just as it was a perfect creation in the beginning with no death and no suffering, no disease, no bloodshed, one day it will be perfect again. Looking forward to that? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, right? Because of man's sin, the corruption, Adam's sin, bringing death and suffering into this world, that's why we need a Savior, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross in our place to pay the debt we could never pay. Just as it was a global flood in Noah's day with one way to be saved at that time, there's another global judgment coming. 
the second time by fire. And there's only one way to be saved. Jesus says, I'm the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved. And then the confusion, the Tower of Babel. We'll talk about this in our last session today. Oh, what a good session it is. I'm telling you, the, this, tower, this event of the Tower of Babel, it reminds us that ultimately we all go back to one man and one woman. So I'll give away my punchline. According to the Bible, how many races are there? One. The human race. And by the way, this is why we are all sinners and need a Savior, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, became part of our blood to pay the debt on our behalf. And you see the connection of all these things. It all goes together, cannot be divorced. Here's the bottom line. If that history is not true like our culture says and like much of the church is saying, then why should we trust the rest? And some people say, okay, Brian, I get that. that makes sense, but still, it's just Genesis. It can't be that important. And I'm going to suggest to you that's exactly what the enemy wants you to think. Because actually, if you kind of flesh this out, Genesis is the foundation to every single biblical doctrine, either directly or indirectly. A couple examples. Where does marriage come from? Which book of the Bible? Genesis. Where do we see the origin of sin and death? Which book of the Bible? Genesis. Why do we have a seven-day week? It goes back to, and only, Genesis, by the way. Uh, there's no unit of measurement for this outside of the Bible. Why do we wear clothes? I noticed you are, and that's good. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> but why do we do that? It goes back to Genesis. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why is he called the last Adam? Why do we need a new heavens and a new earth? It goes back to Genesis. It's the foundation. And if you remove that foundation, what's going to happen to the structure? It will collapse. And we see it happening right before our very eyes in our culture today. I heard someone recently cleverly say that if God thought Genesis was so important, he should have put it closer to the beginning of the book. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's the first book for a reason. Uh, but let me give you just two prime examples of how biblical doctrines have come under attack by, in a real sense, attacking Genesis. The first one we'll look at is marriage. And I think we all agree this uh, this particular doctrine is under attack today. And when Jesus was asked about marriage by the Pharisees, he did, he did something radical by Christian standards today. <laughs> he quoted from the Bible to respond, right? And he said to them, have you not read? Translation, don't you read your Bibles? <laughs> that he who made them at the when? Beginning. Made them male and what? That's where we get our two genders. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And we realize that the doctrine of marriage is based on the biology and the history of Genesis being true. You become one flesh. Why? Because it's based on the fact that the woman came from the man. Just like the Bible says, the woman, praise God, did not come from the ape woman. <laughs> Amen, fellas. <laughs> Maybe a hallelujah. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> no, no, she came from the man, like the Bible says. <laughs> and, and guys, you know, here's the thing. We can say dogmatically, authoritatively, with love and getting to the gospel, we can say passionately, authoritatively, that we know marriage is between one man and one woman, one woman for life. Why? Because God who made it, made it between one man and one woman. He made it. He defines what it is. It comes from this word. But here's the thing. If we don't think this is the authority, and or Genesis is not real history, where we find this doctrine originating, then why not take man's ideas and reinterpret marriage and make it whatever you want it to be? Which is what our culture is doing. Let me give you another example. This one's a little more subtle, but it's really, really important. The doctrine of death and its relation to the atoning work of Christ is also under attack. You say, how? I'll well, we kind of flesh it out, all right? But this is subtle, but really, really important. You see, according to the Bible, when God made creation, he made it perfect. You know, Bob, God gave us what he wanted, which was perfection. And he told Adam, the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely what? Die. Actually, Hebrew phrase, dying, you shall die. You'll start to die physically, eventually die spiritually, die immediately. But dying, you shall die. Death is a consequence of man's sin. And the Bible is clear all the way through. You see in Genesis 3, Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation, that it was man's sin that brought death into God's perfect creation. Death is an intrusion. It's an invader into God's perfect creation because of man's sin, because the wages of sin is death. 
like the Bible says. Romans 8.22 says, All of creation groans in pain because of the consequences of man's sin, bringing death and the curse into this world. In the Bible, we see the first death of an animal in Genesis chapter 3, after man sins, where God kills an animal, he sheds his blood. In a real sense, the first blood sacrifice, where he sheds the blood of the animal to make clothing for Adam and Eve to cover their sin and their shame. And really, that's a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who has shed his blood to cover our sin and our shame. Now, if you're a Christian, you're like, okay, yeah, I get that. That's hey, all good. Praise God for that. Where's the attack? Here's the attack. If you try to squeeze man's idea of millions of years into God's word, no matter how you do it, you'll put death before sin. Theologically impossible undermines multiple doctrines of the Bible, including the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll show you a couple really quickly. First of all, Genesis 129, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. And then in verse 30, all the beasts of the earth, everything with a breath of life, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. So originally, everything was vegetarian. Now I get it. That sounds weird to us today, right? But it does make really good biblical sense because think about it. The Bible's clear there was no death until after Adam's sin. This is his sin. There's no death until after his sin, which means you can't eat meat until after his sin because when you eat meat, you're eating an animal that has what? Died. Before his sin, there is no death. Everything has to be vegetarian. Makes really good biblical sense. And we're told in Genesis 9, God tells Noah after the flood, it wasn't until then that he said, Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now Noah, now you can eat everything. Which, by the way, is why you can eat a hot dog. Because it is everything. So even... <laughs> You're welcome. Um, the, uh... <laughs> but why is this a problem? Well, because in the fossil record, which is the alleged evidence of millions of years, and was supposedly laid down millions of years before man ever existed, thus before sin... In that fossil record, from the secular perspective, we find evidence of animals eating each other. But wait, the Bible says they were originally vegetarian. We find evidence in the fossil record of things like brain tumors, cancer, diseases, other things like arthritis. But the Bible says God looked down on day six and he called everything very good. He would not call millions of years of death and suffering diseases like cancer very good if he did he would not be a very good god if this were true the next time a loved one of yours gets cancer god would call that very good this part of his original very good creation also it make god the author of death by the way we find thorns in the fossil record supposedly hundreds of millions of years old but the bible is clear thorns came after a curse they're a symbol of the curse that's why christ on the cross wore the crown of what thorns bearing our curse for us and then most important of all, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a later session, if you try to squeeze millions of years into God's Word, no matter how you do it, there's lots of them. Day-age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, framework hypothesis, cosmic temple, many others. They all have this one fundamental, fatal, theological flaw. They all put death before sin. Undermines the gospel. Here's how. You got millions of years, you got death before sin. If you got death before sin, then death is not the consequence or the payment for sin. It's just always been around. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not pay our sin debt. And we just destroyed the foundation for the gospel, whether we meant to or not. And at best, we've made this unnecessary. And guys, that's why we're so passionate about this stuff. Not winning a debate, but defending biblical authority where the attack is happening today. Genesis is the foundation for every single biblical doctrine. The gospel begins in the book of Genesis, not in the book of Matthew. And that's why this is so important. Some would say, but okay, Brian, that makes sense, but wait a minute, hold on. Are you telling me that I can't be a Christian if I don't believe in a 6,000-year-old earth and a literal global flood and a literal atom? Guys, of course, that's not what we say. Go to Romans 10, 9. Confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead. And believe in a young earth in six literal days, you'll be saved. <laughs> That's from Second Heresies, I think. All right? Maybe Third Opinions. All right? <laughs> no, in honor of the celebration of the Reformation, the 500th year, right? We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, plus nothing else. So it's not a direct salvation issue, but it is an authority issue. 
Because where does the message of Jesus Christ come from? It comes from the Word of God. If we can't believe this bit over here, why would we trust this part over here? And again, this is why it's so important that we're ready to give an answer for our faith where, where the attack is happening today. And I think so many Christians aren't doing this because we've, we've bought the secular lie that you can't use the Bible to do science because the Bible is not a science textbook. Do you know our response to that? You're right, and praise God. Science textbooks change every year. They do. But where the Bible touches on science, we can trust it. Why? Because it is the Word of God. And what the Bible does for us, it doesn't give us all the details for biology, geology, or so forth, but what it does do is it gives us the big picture of history. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we use to apply to the evidence in the present. And this is important because we all live in the present, right? Right? Raise your hand if you're with me in the present, just checking. <laughs> Heavy talk. <laughs> good, you guys are with me. Very good. Let me ask you a tricky question. This trips people up all the time. When do fossils exist? Past or present? Be careful. <laughs> they exist in the present. If they didn't, we would not have them. True? And when we find a bone in the dirt, we've got to recognize that bone does not come with a label on it saying, hey, I'm 65 million years old, made in China. <laughs> and they just don't do that. And bones do not talk. And when you find a bone in the dirt, all you know for sure is that something has died. And here's my point, is that all the evidence scientists have, whether they're secular or biblical, it exists here, now, in the present. All scientists got the same rock layers, the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, the same distant star, like the same DNA, but they interpret those things differently in the present and reach different conclusions about their origin based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past, based ultimately on their different worldviews. Bottom line is this, if you start with the wrong assumptions, guess what you'll most likely get? The wrong conclusions. And this is why the secular scientists are so wrong about particular things, especially regarding unseen history. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Let me give you one example to kind of drive this point home. Uh, anybody know what this thing is right here? That is a calf puller. You say, what? Yeah, that's a calf puller. Every day when a cow is having trouble giving birth to that baby calf, you take this pole, push it against the cow, take that cable, attach it to the calf, and then crank the calf out of the cow. I know. I've never done it. I've never seen it. I don't want to, all right? <laughs> it just sounds disturbing. But uh, there's a story involving one of these. He had a farmer had a cow giving birth, but there was a breech birth. The calf was coming out backwards, hind legs first, so he had to use his calf puller. And it just so happened this was all taking place by the side of a road. And as he's doing this, a city guy drives by and he sees this train wreck happening, right? So the guy slams on his brakes, pulls over, runs up to get a closer look. The farmer looks up and he sees the guy. He kind of laughs to himself and he says, hey, have you ever seen anything like this before? And the city guy said, no, I've never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, you got any questions? The guy said, yeah, I got one. The farmer said, let's hear it. The guy said, well... I mean, just um, how fast was that calf going when it hit that cow? <laughs> Some of y'all get that later. <laughs> no, he's not separating a wreck, amen? <laughs> Praise God. No. And here's the thing, guys. Secular scientists have reached some really wrong conclusions about certain things, like the age of the Earth and rock layers and dinosaurs, distant starlight, and so forth. Why? Because they're starting with the wrong assumptions about the unseen past. They've elevated man's word over God's word about history. And guys, no one is neutral. Everyone's got a worldview. Everyone's got a bias. The question is, which bias is the best bias to be biased by? I think that made sense, all right? Everyone's got a worldview. No such thing as neutrality. Either you're for Christ or you're what? Either walk in light or you're walking what? Jesus said you're either with me or you're against me. Either you gather with me or you scatter. There is no such thing as neutrality. It's about time we recognize that and we stand on God's word boldly to give defense, to answer the skeptical questions of this age by standing on the sure foundation of God's word and defending our faith. And when we do that, wow, we can really answer the questions of this age. That's really kind of what this whole conference will be all about. You see, when you stand on God's word, you can answer those quote-unquote tough questions. They're really not that hard if we just stand on God's word. Questions like this one. 
How did Noah get all those animals onto the ark? Right? Well, a couple things. If we look at the biblical account, ask yourself a couple questions. How big was the ark? Well, the ark was over 500 feet long. 85 feet wide, 50 feet tall, three different levels, over 100,000 square feet. Looks something like this when you walk up to it at northern Kentucky at the Ark Encounter. It is huge, absolutely gigantic vessel. Got to get rid of these sorts of pictures from our minds. That was not Noah's Ark. Blow that up, burn it, do something with it, but it's not biblical. And also the Bible tells us very clearly, Noah took two of each kind of animal onto the ark. Two of each kind, not two of each species. And the word kind in the Bible is equal roughly to about the family level of modern day classification. So for example, Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs with him on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. <laughs> All right. He was a blessed man, all right? And, He just took two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two of the cat kind, so forth and so on. Actually, two too many of the cat kind, but two of the basic kinds of animals on the ark. Actually, just taking the kinds, he would need roughly around 1,400 total kinds. In a worst-case scenario, 7,000 individual animals. That's in a worst, worst-case scenario. And those fit with absolutely no problem whatsoever onto that huge, huge ship. And then we should be connecting the flood to geology. If there was a global flood as described in the Bible, we would expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Guess what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And some protest, but wait, it doesn't take a long time to make rock layers. No, water, dirt, minerals, rock conditions. You make rock layers in no time flat. A few examples. Here's a ship's bell encased by rock. Here's a clock in a rock. Here's a spark plug in a rock. None of those things are millions of years old. Or Mount St. Helens, it erupted back in 1980. You might remember that a couple of you, 1980 it erupted, it produced rock layers, hundreds of rock layers in hours or days. It did not take long periods of time. Big ones and little ones in no time flat. Even laminated rock layers, an amazing thing. Even produced canyons like this one called the, or nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon because it's 140th the size of the Grand Canyon. With similar features, steep, side, steep walls, sidebar canyons, lack of debris at the bottom. Very similar. Guys, it formed this canyon in nine hours. We just watched it happen. Great, observable, scientific, repeatable evidence. It does not require long periods of time to make those sort of structures. What you really need is a catastrophe. And oh, if you want bigger rock layers and bigger canyons, what you need is a bigger catastrophe like a global flood. Exactly. And as we look around the world, the features of the rock layers screamed. They were laid down very quickly. For example, I was just at the Grand Canyon back in April, over here at the Carbon Canyon, Side Canyon. All over the world, we find multiple rock layers bent at over 90 degrees, and they didn't even crack. How do you bend a rock layer without it cracking? You have to lay all the rock layers down at the same time, and while they're all still wet, to bend them in the same direction. Then they harden. That's what you would happen during a flood. Rock layers laid down all at the same time during that year-long flood, bent towards the end as it wraps up with the tectonic activity taking place. Some say, what about fossils? Don't they take a long time to form? No, fossils actually are evidence of a rapid process. You've got to bury something deeply and quickly to protect it from scavengers and decomposition, right? A couple few examples of this. Here's a petrified ham turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried in a volcanic eruption. No relation to our president and CEO, Ken Ham, all right? But <laughs> it is a petrified ham. <laughs> I know. Don't tell him I said that. Oh, um, <laughs> Here's a fish, fossilized in the very act of eating another fish. Pretty much instantaneous. This poor guy did not get to finish his last meal. That's why I called this fossil the Last Supper. Yes. I know, I know it's bad, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not really sorry, but you know what I mean. Okay, so. Here's an ichthyosaur, fossilized in the very act of giving birth, which does not take millions of years, praise God, to the mothers, right? Or, uh, we, we're not doing this talk this time around, but if you get a chance, we talk about dinosaurs later on, but we have now found over and over and over and over, and I can show you probably 30 slides of this, it just gets boring. Inside dinosaur bones, we're finding remnants of soft tissue from the dinosaur still intact. It's still stretchy, it's still pliable. In many cases with the tissue, we're finding blood vessels and red blood cells still there. Here's the thing. These organic remnants should not last hundreds of years after the creature's death, maybe thousands in special conditions. 
no way millions. And we find this over and over and over again. Tremendous evidence the biblical time scale is correct. Or you may have heard that carbon-14 dating proves the earth is millions of years old. Ever heard that before? Popular notion, been around for a while. Actually, carbon-14 is one of the best evidences for a young earth. You say, really? How? Come back for the third session. We're going to talk about that, all right? We'll talk about the age of the earth and some of those dating methods. But here's my point. If we stand on God's word and equip ourselves with a biblical worldview, we can actually answer the skeptical questions of this age. It's not that hard. You don't need a PhD. Just stand on God's word. We can defend our faith. And as we see how these things confirm God's word, it is amazing confirmation for a believer and a challenge to the skeptic. And it clears away a path for the gospel, getting rid of their excuses to bring them with a face-to-face confrontation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some would say, okay, Brian, I mean, you went through those pretty quick, but, um, I mean, that stuff seems fairly evident. Fairly evident. Then how come so many really smart people miss what appears to be clear evidence as you presented it? Well, here's why. Because it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. And then it becomes a worldview issue. I'll say it again. It's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. And then becomes a worldview issue. And what is the heart issue? The heart issue is old as Genesis chapter 3. Do we submit to the word of God and bow the knee to his word as our ultimate authority? Or do we reject it and man's word becomes our final authority? That's the issue of the heart. We don't want to bow to the word of God. We want to be our own authority. A battle is old as Genesis chapter 3. And guys, what we're seeing in America today, bottom line has been an attack on God's word. Man's word replacing it as a foundational foundation for our thinking as a culture, and we're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. And now multiple generations, both inside and outside the church, no longer build our thinking on God's word as a result of this attack. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. And you say, okay, Brian, you said that a few times now. What do we do about it? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. You guys asked the best questions, all right? I'm going to sum up this session with these two castle diagrams. And again, this is the foundation for the rest of the sessions today. Think about it like this. Two castle diagrams. Castle on the right represents Christianity built on the foundation of God's word, the doctrines that come out of that foundation, the gospel itself. Castle on the left represents secular humanism, the idea that man can determine truth, very prevalent in our culture today, and the moral relativism that results from that way of thinking we see in our culture today. Notice a couple of things very quickly. First, notice the humanists, driven by the enemy, are very clever. Don't attack the virgin birth. Don't attack the deity of Christ. Don't attack the resurrection. Don't worry about that stuff. Just attack the foundation. Attack the history. Because once the foundation goes, what happens to the structure? It's going to fall. Very clever. And then notice the Christians. Some have no idea what's going on, Right? Some, right here, are destroying their own foundation. We don't need Genesis. It's not that important. We can believe in evolution millions of years. It's not a big deal. By the way, that guy represents the majority of our Christian colleges, Bible colleges, and seminaries in our culture today. Some are asleep. Some are fighting each other over the color of the carpet. Right? And then some, I think... That's most of us right there. We look onto the culture. We think, wow, we've got to fight against all these social ills. We've got to fight against so-called gay marriage and abortion, euthanasia and racism. And we do need to fight against those things in truth and love. That's true. But friends, those things are not the problems. They're the symptoms. They're the symptoms of a loss of biblical authority in our culture today. And for all the time, money, and effort we have spent fighting those symptoms, is it working? The answer is No. We're becoming less Christian every day, right? And why isn't it working? Well, because in a real sense, we're trying to change the culture. But guys, nowhere in God's word does it say change the culture. The Bible says go into the world and preach the what? Preach the gospel and to make disciples that God would change hearts and minds. God would change people from the inside out. That will change their worldview. That will change the culture. You see, we're losing this culture war, quote unquote, because we are fighting the symptoms and not the source So what is the solution? Actually, it's fairly simple, and praise God for that. We like simple, amen? The answer is simply this. We need to stand on God's word. 
restore God's word as our foundation for our understanding of all things, past, present, and future. And when we stand on God's word, then we'll be equipped and we can equip the coming generations to answer the skeptical questions of this age, defend our faith, and boldly proclaim the gospel to the lost and dying world, showing people that God's word is true about all things, past, present, and future. It's right about salvation. Put your faith and trust in him. You see, the answer to the problem in our culture is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always has been, and it always will be. But that gospel, the, that gospel rests in the authority of God's word, which begins in Genesis 1.1. If you can't trust this part, why trust the rest? Recognizing where the attack is taking place today and standing on God's word, that's why these answers are so important. There are tons of them. We'll go through a lot more later on during the session about evolution, the age of the earth, and so forth. Great answers. And they're not that hard just by standing on God's word. But again, here's what we're doing. We're giving answers to get to the answer, Jesus Christ. Recognizing, ultimately, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. And the gospel is what God uses to change the heart. This is why we're so passionate. A few resources I'll point you to. We bring a lot of resources with us wherever we go because we want to equip you to do this in your own homes, in your own churches. Um, studies show when you come to a conference like this and hear somebody speak really fast like me, all right, with a weird accent, <laughs> uh, that in three days you'll forget about 90% of what you just heard, which makes me sad because I'm working hard, all right? <laughs> so, won't you, so when you do forget, like we all do, we want you to have the resources available so you can read the book, watch the DVD, equip yourself and equip others to know these answers to defend the faith. A few things I'll suggest to you before we move on. The book, The Lie, it's kind of the foundational textbook of our ministry apart from God's Word, uh, why we do what we do. It's kind of this talk in a book form. So if you're looking for a book version of this talk, more in depth, that's the book. The nice one-two punch with that book is the book already gone. We mentioned the two-thirds walking away from the faith and what we can do to stop it. This book goes right along with the book, The Lie. It goes in that research a lot uh, deeper, and it's really, really well, well done. It gives you some good answers, too. Uh, in regards to how we deal with this. If you don't like to read, we've got you covered. We've got the Genesis of the Gospel. Basically, this talk on DVD uh, by me. So you can buy the DVD and share this message with other people uh, if they need to hear, especially Christians today and Christian leaders. And then for the answers themselves, we've got the answers books one through four. It got us, if I didn't work for the ministry, I'd still say every Christian home, every home period, needs a copy of these books in their home. Each book answers around 25 to 35 different questions. Each chapter is a different question. So you can read them out of order. What about the caveman? What about distant starlight? What about radiometric dating? What about uh, carbon-14 dating? Whatever it is, we have chapters on those. And each chapter is around 10 to 15 pages. So you can read one chapter and get one answer. It's a great reference tool to go back to. You need to remind yourself of those answers. They're phenomenal. Uh, we got those for teens and kids as well, which, by the way, kids are also really good. And by the way, parents, these things are great for us. You read these to your kids, you're learning as you read, and they're learning too. It's really, really good. we got tons of books for younger kids. You'll see that it's all in the gym, the resources, Ennis for Noah, Deus for Dinosaurs, stuff like that. We go through biblical history with a rhyme scheme. Kids love it. No bathtub arcs, praise God, all right? The real boat. And then for you know, the teens out there and ADD adults, we got tons of DVDs, all right? I understand. I feel your pain. So if you don't like to read, DVDs galore, answers DVDs, uh, DVDs on different topics. What about uh, Adam and Eve? What about uh, the age of the earth? What about the rock layers? All those sorts of things. And then also, here's a book I cannot recommend highly enough. Quick answers to tough questions. Because we're all busy. Amen? And I love the answers books. They're phenomenal, but they're a little bit more in depth. So in this book, what we sought to do is to give you quick answers to these questions. Each answer is 500 words or less per answer. So you get the answer really, really quickly. It's, done. it's a nice, good summary. It's, a lot of, it's, really, it's really well done. The illustrations are really well laid out. It's engaging visually for young adults and just adults and teens. It's really good for a lot of age groups, 10 to 100. Really effective in giving answers in a quick fashion. Now, I can't recommend the book highly enough because I wrote it, all right? <laughs> putting my cards on the table. I did write this particular book, me and Bodu Hodge. And so the, but it's, we praise God for it. And it's a really good, it's a practical tool. You can do this, use this very quickly to defend your faith. Also, a really good one I point out to you as well, this book I can't recommend highly enough either. I did not write this one, all right? It's called The 10-Minute Bible Journey, and oh, this book is needed in Christianity today. What it does is it walks through biblical history in 52 10-minute reads. And so you're walking through biblical history chronologically. And guys, if you've never studied the, through the Bible chronologically, it is amazing, when you look at the people and biblical events in their correct chronological order, a couple of things start to happen. Number one, the Bible starts to make sense. 
All of it. It's like it's got an author who knows what he's talking about. It's crazy. And as you go through it chronologically, you see the gospel unveiled all the way through. It's all about Jesus Christ. And what Dale's done there with the book, he's answered questions. Some of them, as you go through, light on apologetics, but they're in there. Of course, they're infused. It's got a nice chart in the back. It is an incredible resource. Great for personal devotions or family devotions. Great, great tool. I encourage you to check that one out. And then take advantage of the special. We've got a, a YouTube special going on here at the conference, only for the conference. Uh, basically, any combination of books or DVDs for those prices, you'll see those out in the gym later on. But any combination, the more you buy, the more you save. And uh, I would encourage you, the 30 for 199 that's around 650 per item. And in some cases, that is close to our cost for the item. And we're doing that on purpose so you can get equipped and defend the faith and share these answers with others. The Begin book is a great way to start use this for new believers or unbelievers. It's a great evangelistic tool, goes through biblical history, gives answers to questions, gives the gospel. Only three bucks. Uh, me and my wife buy a bunch of these, and we keep these in our cars to hand out as we're going about life to share the gospel in an effective way. Also, the magazine's incredible as well. comes out six times a year. Really well done, around 80-some pages long. Won so many awards. They just knock it out of the park with this thing. They do a phenomenal job. One of the top-selling Christian magazines in the world. Got a kid's section in it. Kids love it. Scientifically proven. There's my son reading at 15 months. <laughs> because he's advanced. Um, He's looking at pictures like his dad, but that's not the point, all right? The point is there's a kid section, and it's a really effective tool. And I encourage you to check out the subscription offers. For each year you subscribe to the magazine here at the conference, you get a free DVD up to three. So you do a three-year subscription, that's, um, 30, that's $69. You get three DVDs, which are normally $35 here at the conference. That's like the three-year subscription for $34. Really, really good tool. It's great to have around your home. Really good stuff, so I encourage you to check that out. Also, there's some of the other things we brought I can tell you about. I want to give you an overview so you can have some of your questions answered. But I've read most of our stuff. I've watched most of it. So if you've got any questions about it, please come see me and ask me about a particular resource, maybe for you or someone you know that, you, that might be more helpful for them where they're at or, or study you're doing. Uh, and by the way, let me encourage you throughout the day and tomorrow. Uh, I am here. First, it's a blessing to be here. It's good to be in California. It's nice and sunny. All right. Um, but I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve the body of Christ. It's a blessing to be here. So if I can serve you in any way, that's why I'm here. So if you've got any questions, please ask. We'll engage on those. Love to help in any way I can. Uh, I encourage you to sign up for the free interest update. comes out monthly. Kind of tells you where we're going to be as speakers and what's going on in the ministry. And then if you're like, hey, Brian, that all sounds great. But, man, I'm sorry. We just don't have the money. We can't buy stuff. That's fine. We got the website, answersingenesis.org. It is top notch. It really is. It's so well done. And guys, literally, there are thousands of articles on the website for free, covering pretty much every single question you can imagine. Very technical articles to very layman friendly articles, whatever you want on the website. We've got videos free on the website, hundreds of them. Use them, watch them, share them. They're there for you to equip yourself and equip others. And then also, if you're a scientist and you're thinking, man, I want to dive deep, give me something that dives deep. We have Answers Research Journal for free on the website as well. Peer reviewed scientific journals on radioisotope dating or the fossil record or whatever. Dive as deep as you want. Try to come up for every now and again, all right? But it's all there. You might as well bookmark the website because you can spend millions of years at the website. Just say it. Um, <laughs> And then we will take a little break. When we come back, we'll talk about do animals evolve? And to answer that question, we'll define our terms. It's like the picture, all right? But we'll come back and talk about that. But <laughs> I do want to, I want to wrap up with one last story. Keep the thing, the, the focus on the main thing here. And kind of keep us thinking this way. And again, we'll use this foundation to gauge the answers. But one last thing, and we'll take a break. A story about a captain who was on his ship at night. And as he looked onto the distance, he saw a light. And he just assumed that light was another ship. And so he told his crewmen, hey, radio that ship and tell them to deviate 10 degrees to the north to avoid collision. So the guy did. Moments later, back came the response, uh, negative, you must deviate 10 degrees to the south. And of course, the captain, he didn't like that very much. He said, give me that, Mike. He said, this is Captain Nelson. You will change your course 10 degrees to the north. Back came the response, uh, uh, negative, sir, sorry, but this is Private Martin. You must change your course 10 degrees to the south. Of course, the captain, he was livid. He said, son, you will change your course. This is a naval destroyer. Back came the response, uh, sir, this is a lighthouse. <laughs> we do not ask the light built on the rock to change for us. We change for it. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a chance to gather together uh, to talk about these issues, to study your word, to study your creation. What a blessing it is to be here and to have this time to focus on your word, to be with other believers and maybe non-believers to, to engage them and challenge them with your word and maybe see you do amazing things in all of our lives. God, we, we just confess up front. In, in many ways, God, we've struggled. We, we've compromised in different areas. We've compromised your word, maybe unknowingly. We repent of that. Lord, help us in whatever area it is, whether it's how we understand the past, how we live in the present, how we expect for the future. God, help us, Lord, to be obedient to your word and take every thought captive and make it obedient to you. God, you're God. You're not Superman. You're beyond. You are God. There's nothing even close to you. You know all things. You are perfect in righteousness and holiness. You are God. May we humbly submit to you. You alone are God, not us. Help us, Lord, to be ready to give an answer for our faith, not to win debates, not to puff ourselves up, but, Lord, so we can clearly present the truth of your word and clearly present the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would work through your word, through your gospel, to change hearts and lives for your glory, for your kingdom. It is all from you, about you, for you, and to you. God, we love you. We praise you. May you be glorified in this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.